And to look at some of the political issues of the week, it's time for our news commentators segment. We're joined in the studio by Labor MP Pat Conroy and Liberal MP Craig Kelly. Thank you both for joining yeah, us. Great morning. Morning. We're going to start off with the Aged Care Royal Commission, which kicked off this mm. week. Before uh, that commission even started, Ken Wyatt, the Aged Care Minister, announced some new regulations mm. to prevent the unlawful use of physical and chemical mm. restraints. Does Labor support that? Absolutely, although we have to ask the question, why did it take five years to, to come to this point? This is a government that had to be dragged kicking and screaming to the Royal Commission. This is a government led by a Prime Minister who cut $1.2 billion from aged care funding when he was Treasurer. This is a government that has 127,000 people waiting for aged care packages. I have one of the oldest electorates in the country. I welcome this Royal Commission. I welcome these new regulations. But on the eve of an election, I've got to be pretty cynical about the motives behind this government. Uh, Craig, uh, did it take too long for these sorts of rules to come into place? Because th there have been several reports calling for this sort of regulation and there hadn't been a lot of action. Oh, it's good to see Pat congratulating the government for a change. We've got the Royal Commission up and running. It's due to report mid-2020. Uh, and look, this is an issue that concerns many Australians. More of us are ageing. We've got a greater percentage of the population that will need aged care as we go ahead. It's important we look at it and we make sure we've got all the settings right. This is a question for both of you. Pat, you talk about funding. Obviously, there are complex issues mm. here, but would both of you, if you were in government, commit to more funding in this area? Money isn't the only answer, mm. but it goes a long way. Well, I'm not going to announce our policy uh, at 9.15 on a Saturday morning, sadly, but I think it is incredible that this government has cut uh, $1.2 billion, and we do have 127,000 people waiting for packages. I have people in tears in my office quite regularly trying to get a package for either themselves or a loved one. We have a sector in crisis. More absolutely needs to be done, and you would expect us to have something to say about it. Craig, is more money the answer? Oh, more money is part of the answer, yes. And this is the most important thing as we get into the election, whether it's for schools or for hospitals or whatever it is. The way we get more money into the system is to have a strong economy. Money doesn't come from, you know, it doesn't grow on trees, it doesn't come from, you don't, we can't do it by running up big budget deficits as we have in the past. We've got to make sure that we sustain, we're funding this in a sustainable way. And the best way to do that is to ensure that we have a strong economy going forward. But Craig, um, we're going to have to wait such a long time for this Royal Commission to do the good work that it needs to do. Can we afford to wait that long? We're already seeing horror stories of, of dementia patients being beaten in their rooms mm. and being neglected. Uh, what's going to happen oh, in the interim? Look, and doesn't it, the government look, need to step in? You are absolutely right, and there's been some horror stories, and that's the reason why you need a Royal Commission. You know, Unfortunately, we'd like to have a Royal Commission wrapped up very quickly, but it has to hear all the evidence, make the recommendations. In the meantime, if particular issues come up, I'm sure in a bipartisan way that we can act and we can fix those. We don't have rather than wait until the full report. Well, we have 127,000 Australians waiting for packages right now. The government has said they're entitled to that package, they qualify for the package, but the funding is not there. That's something that should be fixed without waiting for a Royal Commission because those people are in dire need. All right, we'll move on to our next topic. Fiji and Prime Minister Frank Barney-Marama has made some pretty firm comments uh, directed towards Australia, encouraging it to move towards more renewables. Mm. What did you make of those comments? We've already spent something like uh, $50 billion dollars over the last decade to build renewables in this country. Uh, and we have to still, again, going back, you have to have a strong economy to help Fiji. This year it's something like $58 billion of foreign aid that we'll directly give the Fijian government uh, to help various uh, parts of their society and their country. You can't do that again without a strong economy. Now, we've spent $50 billion on renewables. The chief scientist has said this will have no effect whatsoever on the climate. So I'm really not sure what the uh, the Fijian uh, Prime Minister is actually going on about. Well, I think he's going on about the fact that Australia at the moment isn't on track to meet mm. its own targets for, for uh, climate and emissions reductions. So uh, isn't it uh, prudent for Australia to to pick it up a gear uh, if we're going mm. to meet those those commitments well, that look, we've made? Well, I think, as everyone knows, our Kyoto targets, we actually beat those. We're well, ahead of those Kyoto well, targets. And we look at if we look at the, around the world, We've got countries like China actually increasing their emissions each year greater than Australia's total emissions. But we have to be honest about this. There's nothing that we do in Australia that is going to affect cyclones or sea levels in Fiji. The best way that we can help the Fijian people is to ensure that we have a strong economy, we can give them the generous foreign aid that can help them mitigate any bad weather what, that they have. What Craig has just said condemns our Pacific sister and brothers 
to a horrible, horrible life. Unchecked climate change is an existential threat to the entire Pacific uh, island nations, all of those. The government's 2030 target, firstly, is inadequate at 28% cut on 2005 levels. Secondly, the government's own figures, which they released just before Christmas, says they're not even going to meet it. The government's own figures say that they will only cut emissions by 7% versus 28%, and carbon pollution under this government has increased every year since 2014. They've gone up 5%. What Craig and the Liberal Party are about is denying climate change. They're not taking any action on climate change, condemning uh, our region to a huge, huge negative impact. And we need to play our part. We're the 12th largest emitter of carbon pollution in the world. The rest of the world is looking for us to be part of the solution. I mean, the fi- Joe, if I could just jump in there, Pat. Can you tell me, with Labor's policy, what will the difference in the sea level be in Suva? Well, what well, I tell, tell, tell no, what, what I can say is... To the nearest is, millimetre, what, the nearest what I can millimetre say how much will renewable Craig, policy reduce your the level of sea level? Your excuse for doing super. nothing. The Paris Accord, if implemented, will uh, restrain uh, greenhouse gas warming, no, you, and we need to play our part. What you've just said is... You're about your, the Craig, policy. your excuse is the excuse for every nation not That's to not do their excuse. part. We all need to play our part. And Australia and is doing it's that. Not. Australia is a signature Your government's of the Paris own figures and say you will not hit your own inadequate targets. Well, okay, well, you will how miss much, it by a mile. And how it, much will that affect the sea levels? It will in play a part well, in not us. reaching. In millimetres. I, I, I don't think, I don't think, for doing nothing. I don't think anyone's going to know how, what it's going to do to the millimetre, but I think most people agree that there will be some impact. Uh, we do need to move on, though, because uh, the, the Prime Minister this week uh, put the issue of Australia Day uh, back on on the agenda, um, promising to to strip um, councils of of their rights to to hold citizenship ceremonies if they want to do it outside the 26th. Um, Is this really something that most Australians, that's really front of mind for most Australians? Well, I think most Australians want to celebrate Australia Day on Australia Day, as it has been for a long, long period of time. When the first fleet came around and settled in Sydney Cove. That's Australia Day. That's the day that we became a nation of Australia. And that's what everything that happens in our country today goes back to. The vast majority of Australians want to see Australia Day celebrated on that day. Uh, Pat, should councils be able to determine what what day they they conduct these ceremonies? Well, our policy is we shouldn't look at changing Australia Day, but what we've got from this government is a tired old culture war to distract from their disunity. My constituents, quite frankly, don't care about the dress code of citizenship ceremonies on Australia Day. They care about more jobs, they care about better hospitals, they care about better schools. This is a massive effort of distraction from Scott Morrison to pick a fight with a couple of inner-city Melbourne councils when the main issue should be jobs health and education. So in regards to the day itself, what would be the harm in changing the day? Well, I think it's a distraction at the moment. And uh, we do need to acknowledge that for a significant proportion of our community, that day is a day of great mourning. That is a great day where they saw um, their their Indigenous uh, ancestors invaded. That's obviously uh, for one part of the community. For a lot of the community, they see it as a day of celebrating our national unity. So what's the harm in finding a day that we can all agree on? Well, our policy is not to change it. Our policy is to focus on issues that uh, every Australian really, really want to be concentrating on, which is more jobs, better health care and, and better funding for schools. This is a massive effort from distraction from Scott Morrison and from the Greens and the inner city councils who want a cultural fight rather than concentrating on the issues that really drive my constituents. But we do need to be sensitive about Australia Day and acknowledge that for some people it is enormously hurtful. Just briefly, Craig, I mean, it did seem a little left of field, didn't it? I mean, have you ever been to a, a citizenship ceremony where people are dressed appallingly? It's funny you comment on that. Actually, we go to Pat and myself, I'm sure we all get a lot of Australia Day Um, not Australia Day citizenship ceremonies, but citizenship ceremonies across the board. And I think a dress code is important. But have you You ever seen... Yes, actually I have. I've seen people that I think have been actually... And it almost embarrassed them. I've seen a lot of people at most Australia Day... uh, Sorry, citizenship ceremonies. When they're going to... This is the day that they actually become an Australian. This is a very proud day in many people's lives. And I think when you... Most people come very... Uh, well dressed to those things and I think when you have one or two people actually completely sort of very casually dressed it actually detracts from the entire s- s- uh, ceremony and I think it actually in ways embarrasses people and I would like to have some type of dress oh, code yeah. important I'll be very, very briefly for citizenship ceremony. like seriously as long as people when they sign up to be Australian citizens commit to follow our laws make a contribution to our society I don't care if they turn up in thongs and shorts a sari a full three piece suit as long as they embrace the spirit and value of this country. Well, you've both come uh, dressed for the occasion today, so (laughs) thank you to you both. Thanks a lot.